Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our Bible study today once again. We thank you, Lord, because you have put the love within us, your own love, your own kind of love, to love your word, so that we study your word, and we regularly read your word and match our lives with your word. Lord, we bless your name because we know that this is not a kind of love we can take for granted. It is given by you. We appreciate that you are drawing us closer and closer to yourself as we look at the word of God. Accept our praises in Jesus' name. Oh Lord, we thank you because of the rich, wonderful things we've been teaching us in the book of Exodus. It's been so wonderful, Lord, as we have seen redemption in many areas, in many aspects, as we have learned and studied. We have seen the need for redemption in the first few chapters. We have seen the might of the Redeemer as well. And now we are looking at various things concerning instructions for the redeemed. O oh Lord, we pray that as we look into all these things, they will make definite impact in our lives in Jesus' name. Father, we must thank you that you have counted us among the redeemed of the Lord. These things you are revealing to us, you have hidden away from the wise and the prudent, from the proud and those who feel that they have knowledge enough uh, to guide themselves in their own way. But for us who are babes, for us who are humble and teachable, for us who surrender ourselves before you, and we come wanting to learn, you have always been revealing yourself unto us. We pray, Lord, today that you will reveal the deep truth of your word to every one of us in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, that you also use us to encourage those of our members who have not been coming regularly to such a training, instruction, and a school of wisdom like this, so that Lord Deity will join us, and great will be our knowledge as well as our blessing in Jesus' name. Guide us and teach us today. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name, we pray. Today we come in our study to Exodus chapter 13. If you remember, already we have gone through from chapter 1 to chapter 12. And in chapter 12, we have seen the children of Israel coming out of the land of Egypt. That means that hundreds of years of slavery came to an end. Bondage came to an end. The Lord manifested His power. But I want to remind you that before the Lord manifested His power, there was groaning, there was praying, there was desire. On the side of the children of Israel. And then God told Moses that I have seen the suffering and the groanings of the children of Israel. I have seen their tears. I have heard their cries. And I am come down to deliver them. And the Lord sent Moses to deliver them. Although Moses felt inadequate. But then the Lord prepared him. And the Lord empowered him. Eventually he went into the land of Egypt. He told the elders of the children of Israel. He also confronted Pharaoh with the demand, let my people go. I'm sure you know if you've been following us through the story, that he did not yield, that his Pharaoh did not yield immediately. But by strong arm and in great power, the Lord brought out the children of Israel. The Lord had to perform nine definite miracles, divided into groups of three. And then after the ninth, the Lord did the last one, which was the tenth one which was the slaying of the firstborn in Egypt. And eventually because of the manifestation, the power of God manifested in Egypt, Pharaoh said the people could go. And even the Egyptians were very urgent upon the people, and they thrust them out. And as they came out, they came out with great substance. As they came out with land, the way they came out, they came out orderly. Look at now chapter 12 and verse 51. And it came to pass the self same day that the Lord did bring the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt by their armies. In the original, when it says by their armies, it means that they came out in an orderly fashion. As they came out, orderliness marked their movement as about uh, 600,000 men, not counting women, not counting children, departed in rows and in ranks. That teaches us that in the midst of the children of God, there should not be confusion, there should not be commotion. You see, we should be orderly in everything that we do. 
God is not the author of confusion. So, the congregation of the redeemed must always do all things decently and in order. If we're having a retreat and we have to distribute food, we should be orderly. If we're distributing outlines of the Bible study or the retreat program, we should be orderly. Even in our marriages, everything should be orderly. The reception, all that we do, you see anything that brings a group of people together, we should show that we are the children of God. We should show that God is not the author of confusion. We should show that we are orderly and we do all things decently. You see, sometimes when you uh, get in the midst of some people that are called gospel churches, you will discover that as they distribute food, as they get one thing or the other, there will be so much noise, so much confusion, and they will be so rowdy. But in our midst, it should not be like that. As we look at the example of the children of Israel, how they came out of the land of Egypt by their armies. In fact, this is what we also learn. From the Lord Jesus Christ, when he fed the multitude, we're told that he commanded them to make all sit down by companies upon the green grass. Do you know how they sat down? They sat down in ranks by hundreds and fifties. No wonder it was easy to count those men because, you see, they were able to say about 5,000 men at a particular time, another time about 4,000 men. When they're sitting about in hundreds and in fifties, it's very easy to count them. And everything will be orderly. I believe that even that had been written for our learning. That in our meetings, everything will be orderly. Everything will be done decently. Now, in this chapter 13, where we come, you are going to see that God was giving instruction to the children of Israel. You see, the children of Israel were now outside Egypt. Outside bondage. Deliverance had come. They had now come out of the bondage, and now instructions were being given unto them. Do you know this? It is one thing to be delivered. It's another thing to have instruction in the ways of the Lord. It is not enough to be delivered from Egypt. It was not enough to be delivered from Egypt. They needed to know the way to the promised land. Many in their newfound joy of deliverance and salvation do not Pay sufficient attention to the word of God, which is given to lead us safely to the promised land. But you need to understand, when you make a decision for the Lord, it's a wonderful thing. You believe on the Lord Jesus Christ after you have repented, you become a child of God. It's great. But then, after decision for the Lord, we have discipleship. It's not enough to say, I'm decided for Christ. I've decided to follow Christ. No turning back, no turning back. You see, there needs to be a period of discipleship. That's what we find in the lives of the disciples of the Lord. They followed him, and then he began to instruct them. Instructions came after salvation. And so it is very important for every one of us to realize it is not enough to be saved. We must be instructed in the ways of the Lord. When God saves us by his power and wisdom, he does not leave us to live the Christian life in our own human strength and human wisdom. So that introduces you to what we have in chapter 13, which we're studying today. There are three points we're going to major on, that these three subtopics. We've divided the chapter into three. The first part is from verse 1 to verse 10, remembrance of God's gracious act. The second part, you'll find verses 11 to 16 consecration of all Israel's firstborn. And the third part, verses 17 to 22, we have guidance for God's redeemed people. Let's go to part 1 and let us read now Exodus chapter 13 from verse 1 all through to verse 10. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Sanctify unto me all the firstborn. Whatsoever openeth the womb among the children of Israel, both of man and of beast, it is mine. And Moses said unto the people, Remember this day in which ye came out from Egypt, out of the house of bondage. For by strength of hand the Lord brought you out from this place. There shall no leavened bread be eaten. This day came ye out in the month Abib. 
And it shall be when the Lord shall bring thee into the land of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, which is swear unto thy fathers to give thee a land flowing with milk and honey, that thou shalt keep this service in this month. Seven days thou shalt eat unleavened bread, and in the seventh day shall be a feast unto the Lord. Unleavened bread shall be eaten seven days, and there shall no leaven, no leavened bread be seen with thee. Neither shall there be leaven seen with thee, or in all thy quarters. And I shall show thy son in that day, saying, This is done because of that which the Lord did unto me when I came forth out of Egypt. And it shall be for a sign unto thee upon thine hand. And for a memorial between thine eyes, that the Lord, the Lord's law may be in thy mouth. For with a strong hand, as the Lord brought thee out of Egypt, thou shalt therefore keep this ordinance in a season from year to year. Here we, are, we learn of what the Lord had done. And then God wanted them to institute something so that they'll be able to commemorate their own deliverance. And that will make them to remember every time. Look at verse 3 again. And Moses said unto the people, Remember this day. Remember this day in which ye came out from Egypt, out of the house of bondage. For by strength of hand the Lord brought you out from this place. There shall no leavened bread be eaten. The Lord knew the frailty of man, the frame of man. And he knew that even though the experience had been spectacular, they had been delivered out of the house of bondage. Yet he knew that they could easily forget and they could soon forget. You see, when a dramatic experience of God's gracious act has happened unto us, we think at that moment that we can never forget. But God knows us, just like he knew the children of Israel. He knew that they could forget. Because of that, he commanded them that they should make conscious efforts to remember. Why? Oh, because we are apt to forget too soon. Israel had witnessed unparalleled display of God's power in their redemption and deliverance. The Lord wanted them to keep that deliverance always before them. And so he told them that they should remember. Now, what does remembrance do for us? That is, if you remember such gracious act of the Lord, such powerful demonstration of the might of the Lord, what does that do? What it does is this. Number one, it makes you to be grateful unto the Lord. It leads us into gratitude. Every time you remember something that has been done for you by another individual, and that thing rescued your life, delivered you from danger, or that thing may brought a great blessing to your life, you are grateful. You remember that person and that thought will give gratitude, will make you to be grateful to that individual. The same thing with God. When you remember how he saved you, when you remember your name in the book of life, when you remember the depth of sin in which you went into. But the Lord, by his mighty power, mighty act of salvation, he delivered you, he saved you. He's going to give you gratitude in your heart. Not only that, it leads you to thanksgiving. Not only that you feel grateful within without expressing something, it makes you to even open your mouth and you praise the name of the Lord. That's what you'll discover in, all, in many of the Psalms. You see many of the Psalms, it's just a giving thanks unto the Lord. And it say it will be at a time when the psalmist remembered a great thing the Lord had done for him. As a result of that, he will express his thanks unto the Lord. You find this uh, with Paul the Apostle. Whenever he remembered how injurious he was, a blasphemous person he was, how he destroyed the church, and yet God showed mercy unto him. The remembrance of that mercy will make him to be thankful. Then he will express his thank unto the Lord. It also leads us to obedience. You see, when you remember what great things the Lord has done for you, what happens is that you begin to remember and then you say, if God has done something like that for me, has shown his love unto me, how can I disregard his word? How can I disobey him? How can I rebel against him? It leads you into obedience. Do you know that it also leads you, number four, into faithfulness? You see, you'll be faithful to that God when you remember that this is what he has done for you. Number five, 
it gives you more faith. You see, you are able to trust God for greater things. Oh, you say, he did this before. I remember what he did before. As a result of remembering that, you are able to trust the Lord for greater things. If, on the other hand, instead of remembering, you forget. If you forget like that, do you know what that will do in your life? What that will do is that it will bring some negative things into your own life. Unfortunately for the children of Israel, although the Lord wanted them to remember, they didn't always remember. And because they didn't always remember, then they did not do the way they ought, what they ought to do. I want you to look at Psalm 78. Psalm 78, verses 41 and 42. Yea, they turned back and tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. You see, could that ever have happened to the children of Israel? Oh yes, it did. It happened. It happened to them. They turned back. That's backsliding. They tempted the Lord. They disregarded the Lord. Therefore, they tempted him. They limited the Holy One of Israel. Then it means that they had unbelief. They couldn't follow him all the way through. Do you know the reason for that? It's in verse 42. They remembered not his hand. They remembered not his hand. Nor the day when he delivered them from the enemy. You see, when we forget the goodness of the Lord, the gracious act of the Lord, it's going to bring some other consequences into our lives. Forgetting, forgetfulness of God's great demonstration of power on our behalf is what causes, number one, unbelief. If you find a believer sliding back into unbelief, saying, I don't believe, I don't accept, I don't take those promises of God serious anymore, this problem I have, I don't believe he can take it away because of this, because of that. You know what has happened to them? They have forgotten the mighty demonstration of the power of God in their lives. Forgetfulness would lead to unbelief. Then it also leads to ingratitude. Do you see that the children of Israel, there was a time they were even saying, Why have you brought us up out of the land of Egypt? There is nothing to eat. Because you see this manner you are giving us. Our soul loathed it. We do not want it anymore. They became ungrateful. In fact, they said, we could have died in the land of Egypt. You see, it was because they forgot the bondage and they forgot the deliverance. And when you forget like that, it leads you into ingratitude. Number three, it also leads to idol worship. You will never worship idol when you remember how great your God is, how mighty your God is. If when you remember all those plagues that were done in the land of Egypt, how the Lord severed the children of Israel from the Egyptians, how he protected them and made them special, you will never go into idol worship. But you know, if you forget the gracious act of the Lord, if you forget the great demonstration of the power of the Lord on your behalf, what will then follow is that, number three, you'll get your slide back into idol worship. Not only that, number four, you will slide back into trust in the arm of the flesh. You see, the people that forget God, they are the people that will slide back into trusting in the arm of the flesh. When you trust in the arm of the flesh like that, it is a, a symbol, it is an evidence that you are forgetting the Lord. And you see, when you forget the Lord like that, and you trust in the arm of the flesh, you see, the Lord brings a curse, a judgment upon such people. Jeremiah chapter 17. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 5. Thus says the Lord, Cause said, Be the man that trusteth in man, and maketh flesh his arm, whose heart departed from the Lord. You see, if you have been a Christian, when you first became a Christian, you had persecution, what did you do? You prayed. You had a problem in your place of work, what did you do? You prayed. You were looking for job, what did you do? You prayed. You see, you, when you became born again, because your deliverance was fresh in your mind, your salvation was fresh in your mind, you remembered the power of God. So you solved all your problems by praying. And it is a mark that we are forgetting God whenever we take laws into our hands and we try to solve our problems, not by prayer, but by, de by depending upon the arm of the flesh. You remember that when you became a Christian, maybe your old man posed a problem to you. You didn't fight, you didn't quarrel, you didn't shout, you didn't do anything, but you prayed. And prayer solved the problem. It may be your husband or your wife that posed the problem. It may be the colleagues in the place of work. All you did was to pray because you remembered God, God's gracious act. 
But you know now in the district church, whenever a problem arises, because you are forgetting God, you take loss into your hand, you depend on the arm of the flesh, you say, we're going to fight it through, I'm going to do what I can do, nobody can do that to me, I will depend upon other people. Then you go to this and say, do you like what is happening? You go to that, do you like what is happening? We are going to solve this problem. We're going to use our own human strength. You are depending upon the arm of the flesh now to solve your problem. Because you are forgetting that when you first become, became saved, you depended upon prayer. You depended upon the Lord. When God's gracious act was fresh in your mind, well, eventually, do you know that forgetfulness of God's gracious act, of God's great demonstration of power, will lead to backsliding. That's why the Lord knew that. That's why he told the children of Israel, remember, remember, remember. And many times in scripture, we are commanded to remember. In Numbers chapter 15, Numbers chapter 15, we see the word of God again, how the Lord commanded the people that they should always remember. In Numbers chapter 15, we're looking at it from verse 39. Numbers chapter 15, from verse 39, And it shall be unto you for a fringe, that ye may look upon it and remember all the commandments of the Lord, all the commandments of the Lord, you will remember and do them. And then it says, And that ye seek not after your own heart and your own eyes, after which ye used to go a warring, that ye may remember and do all my commandments and be holy unto your God. What's the basis for that? What is the reason for that? Verse 41, I am the Lord your God, which brought you out of the land of Egypt. To be your God, I am the Lord your God. You see, the Lord wanted them to remember, and was always reminding them too, that they were brought out of the house of bondage. When you remember that every time, it's going to make you faithful. It's going to make you obedient. It's going to make you grateful. It's going to make you give thanks unto the Lord. It's going to make you to submit yourself more and more to the Lord. It's going to make you obedient to the word of the Lord. In Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 15. Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 15. And remember, there we are again, and remember that thou wast a servant in the land of Egypt. Let's stop there for a moment. You see, now these children of Israel, they, were, they came out of the land of Egypt. Now they were victorious. Now they were having supplies from heaven. They were no more slaves now. And not only that, there was no Pharaoh commanding them, controlling them. The taskmasters were no more beating them. All the afflictions and all the suffering, everything had been taken away. They would wake up in the morning and manna was available for them. The pillar of cloud was upon them and the pillar of fire was guiding them. Everything, water was even coming out of the rock for them. They were defeating the Amalekites, you see, in such victory, in such success, in such provision, in such blessing. They could forget what they were before they came to know the Lord. And if they forgot what they were before they came to the Lord, pride could come into their hearts. And it's the same thing with us. You see now you have been born again. And uh, since you are born again, peace of mind has come. Rest has come in your soul. If you pray, you touch heaven and God gives you blessings. He showers blessings upon you. Your word has become the word of authority. Whatsoever you bind on earth is found in heaven. Whatsoever you lose on earth is loose in heaven. It appears that things are going your way. But then remember what you used to be before you came to know the Lord. The Lord wants us to remember how he saved us. How he delivered us. How he turned everything around. How he transformed our lives. And remember that thou was a servant in the land of Egypt. That the Lord that the Lord thy God brought thee out thence through a mighty hand and by a stretched out arm. Therefore, therefore, the Lord thy God commanded thee to keep the Sabbath day. So you will see the Lord wanted the children of Israel to remember. And he wants us to remember our deliverance, our salvation, our redemption. He wants us to remember so that we'll always stand and remain grateful unto the Lord. In Psalm 77. Psalm 77 from verse 10. And I said, this is my infirmity, but I will remember the years of the right hand of the Most High. I will remember the years of the right hand of the Most High. It says, I will remember when the Lord by his mighty hand, his right hand, when he manifested forth his gracious act and he delivered me and he saved me. 
and it translated me from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. I will remember, in verse 11, I will remember the works of the Lord. Surely I will remember thy wonders of old. I will meditate also of all thy works. And then it says, I will talk of thy doings. Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Who is so great a God as our God? Thou art the God that doest wonders. Thou hast declared thy strength among the people. Thou hast with thine arm redeemed thy people, the sons of Jacob and Joseph. So you will see that the Lord wanted them to remember. And they also said they were going to remember. They made up their minds. They, they, they took the decision, I will remember. Now, this commandment to remember, was it only for the children of Israel? And was it only for the old people, the elderly people that came from the land of um, Egypt? No, it's for everyone, for the young and the old. Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and from verse 1. Ecclesiastes chapter 12 verse 1. Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh. When thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them, the Lord is saying that we should remember him in this at the time of our youth. We should remember the Lord. What do you remember of the Lord? One, he created you. It wasn't you that created yourself. That's why we are told that he is a potter and we are the clay. And because he's the one that made us, we are to be so grateful. He's giving us chance to live. Not only that, that he created us, he has also redeemed us, brought us into the kingdom of God. Remember the Lord thy God. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 7 and 8. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 7 and 8. It says, Consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. Remember, remember, remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. Jesus Christ was raised from the dead for justification, for redemption. And so we are to remember that all the time you see for these children of israel god told them they ought to remember let's now go back to exodus chapter 13 and look at verses 6 and 7 something is important here verses 6 and 7 seven days thou shalt eat unleavened bread and in the seventh day shall be a feast unto the lord unleavened bread shall be eaten seven days and there shall no leavened bread be seen with thee, neither shall there be leavened seen with thee in all thy quarters. Now, if you have been with us in the uh, study of Exodus, you would have seen that that had been treated in Exodus chapter 12. Those verses 6 and 7, you will find in verses 14 to 20 of Exodus chapter 12. Isn't that repetition? Oh, yes, it is repetition. Didn't Jesus Christ say that in our prayers, I think in our preaching to you, we should not have vain repetition? Yes, you are right. But he didn't say we shouldn't have valuable repetition. You see, there is vain repetition on one hand, there is valuable repetition on the other hand. Vain repetition is unnecessary repetition. But you see, the Lord knew the hearts of the people, the frailty of the people, the weakness of the people, the tendency to forget important things. Because of that, this wasn't vain repetition, it is valuable repetition. You will find that as you go through in the Bible. Look at, for example, the life of Jesus Christ. He said in Matthew, he said in Mark, he said in Luke, he said in John. Is that vain repetition? No, valuable repetition. Look at the doctrine of salvation, for example. You'll find that doctrine of salvation, you find it in the Gospels, you find it in Acts, you find it in the Epistles, you find it all over. Is that vain repetition? No, valuable repetition. How about the message of holiness? You find it in the Old Testament, you find it in the New Testament, you find it in the historical parts of the Bible, in the prophetic parts of the Bible, in the Psalms, in the New Testament, even in Revelation. Is that vain repetition? No, valuable repetition. Now you see that we ought to be delivered from sin. We ought to make sure that there is no leaven of wickedness, the leaven of evil, the leaven of insincerity, the leaven of hypocrisy, the leaven of worldliness, the leaven of materialism, the leaven of sin, the leaven of false doctrine. All this you get away from our lives. Is that vain repetition? No, it is valuable repetition. So you will find that there are parts of the Bible 
that you will come across will say, I read that before. When you see it the second time or the third time, it makes you to understand that maybe you are forgetting. And forgetfulness of such a thing can bring damnation and indescribable suffering upon your life. Therefore, it does the reason why the Bible has repeated that. You see, whatever God says once is very important. And when God repeats that thing over and over again, then we have no excuse for ignorance or for disobedience. Not only that, the children of Israel were told that they should have the sign upon their hand, the memorial between their eyes and the law of God in their mouth, so that all this will fix the eyes of their children on redemptive truth. So the Lord wanted the children also to be able to understand and to be able to have all the truth of redemption, of deliverance, of all the gracious acts that the Lord had done. Because of that, he said, what they bind on their hand will be showing to the children because the children will ask questions. Why do you have this on your hand? They will remember, they will tell the children, it's for us to remember what the Lord had done for us. Why do you have this between your eyes on your forehead? Or why do you say what you are saying? God's law coming out of your mouth. Then they will tell those children, it is because of what the Lord has done for us. Each family should bring their children to the Lord and keep the children in the truth of the gospel by all means and at all costs. It is a God-given responsibility in the church here as a church to spend and be spent in order to bring redemption truth, salvation, deliverance, holiness, everything that the children need to know the way of the Lord to bring to the children and the youth in the church. Now that leads us to point two, consecration of all Israel's firstborn. Let's look at it from verse 11. Consecration of all Israel's firstborn. In verse 11, And it shall be when the Lord shall bring thee into the land of the Canaanites, as he swear unto thee and to thy fathers, and shall give it thee, verse 12, that thou shalt set apart unto the Lord all that openeth the matrix, and every firstling that cometh of a beast, which thou hast. The males shall be the Lord's. The males shall be the Lord's. Go back to verses 1 and 2. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Sanctify, set apart, devote, consecrate, give unto, unto me, all the firstborn whatsoever openeth the womb among the children of Israel, both of man and of beast, it is mine. You see here the Lord wanted the children of Israel to know that the firstborn of every family, even the firstborn of the animal, of the beast, everything must belong unto the Lord. Once again, you need to remember that this was repeated in different parts of the Bible, different parts of the Old Testament for the children of Israel to remember that the firstborn actually belonged unto the Lord in Numbers chapter 3. Numbers chapter 3 and in verse 13. Because all the firstborn are mine, all the firstborn are mine. Here is the word of the Lord. Because all the firstborn are mine, for on the day that I smote all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, I hallowed, I set apart unto me all the firstborn in Israel, both man and beast. Mine shall they be, I am the Lord. So the Lord claimed all the firstborn of the children of Israel. And the Lord gave the reason there very clearly. God said that at the time the judgment came upon the children of Egypt, all their firstborn had died. You know what the Bible says? The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The wages of sin is dead. And then, because the wages of sin is dead, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All the firstborn of the Israelites too should have died. The same judgment should have come upon the Israelites. And their firstborn should have died too. But those firstborn, they were spared. So now God laid claim, in particular, to the, uh, to the firstborn of the Israelites. Why? By right of protection, by right of redemption. You need to understand that Christ, the firstborn from among many brethren, the only begotten of the Father, has died for us. He was given up to die for our sins. Because he became our substitute, now we are saved. Now we are the children of God, the redeemed of the Lord. 
Do you know what happens now? God lays claim to everyone that is saved and protected by the blood of the Lamb. Why does God lay claim upon us? Because of the right of redemption. He redeemed us. Because of that, he now has a right. He now has a right to claim everything belonging to us. I want to tell you this. I don't want you to forget. Redemption brings responsibility. Redemption brings responsibility. You see, because you are redeemed, it means that you are no more your own. It means that because you have been spared the death penalty. Christ has become your substitute. You are now saved. You are now in the kingdom of God. It means that as the Lord claimed the firstborn in the land of Israel, he now claims you to be his own. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, reading from verses 19 and 20. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. Watch. Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. That's redemption. Therefore glorify God. That's your responsibility. Redemption brings responsibility. For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your, and in your spirit, which is are God. Now, we need to learn a lot from here. And I want to tell you this, you know, Jesus Christ many times, he used illustrations. And those illustrations are called parables. Those parables are illustrations of natural things, explain spiritual things. If Jesus did that, he has given us a model. He has given us a pattern in preaching. That is why we also use illustrations. Now, come back to verse 19. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? Now the temple, as we understand, as the children of Israel understood, was just a building. A building. And, but that building was dedicated particularly to a purpose. And it's the same thing today. You see, you are like a building, like a temple. And you, your body, is dedicated to a particular purpose. Not only that, you see when the temple was built in the Old Testament, all the specifications of the temple, how many doors, how many, how many windows, and the roof and everything, everything was dictated by God. In the same way, your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. All the openings there, everything has been designed and dedicated by the Lord. You have openings in your mouth and in your ears and other parts because the Lord saw that all that was necessary. Not only that, you see when you are the temple, the painting of the temple and the color of the temple. If you go to the tabernacle of the Old Testament, what you will discover is that they were even told uh, where the badger screen should be and where they should be, the color, the outward appearance. Everything was determined by the Lord. Where there should be wood and where there should be brass and other things. The same thing, do you know that you as a child of God, your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. And what God has done, leave it the way he has done it. Now, let me ask you a question. Suppose you have a government building, like, for example, the secretariat, and you happen to be working there. Can you say that you are not pleased with the color of that, uh, of that secretariat? Therefore, you just get a painter without government instruction and without permission from the government. You will just paint it all over. You say, no, that will not be acceptable. Do you know the same thing? As the Lord has created you, as he has made you, he doesn't want the painting of the fingers and the painting of the toes and the painting of the lips and the painting of the eyelashes. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You leave it the way it is. If God has given you the kind of skin, he has given you dark skin because you are here in Africa. God didn't make a mistake. You see, when you read your Bible very well, it's the one that set the bounds of the various nations and it's the one that has given us all the complexion and all everything that you see with us. Is the one that has given it as it has pleased him. As it has pleased him. That's why the Lord doesn't expect any of us men or women to bleach. And uh, when you bleach like that, you see what you are doing. You are saying that God wasn't wise. He didn't. He wasn't wise in making this temple the way it ought to be. Therefore, I will change the color. I will change the appearance. No, you cannot do that. There are some people that will feel that God was not wise enough. He didn't create enough holes in our body. Therefore, you see them, they will puncture their nose and put holes there so that they can have a place for jewelry. 
they also puncture and put holes in the ears so they can have a place for jewelry. You know, if that was necessary, the Lord would have done it. The Lord himself would have put the holes in the ears of the daughters, of the sons, if those things were necessary. But God didn't count them necessary, so he did not put the holes there. Leave it as it is. You see, at other times, there are some people that will feel that our kind of air, you know, is different. The air you have is different from the, uh, from the American or from the British, the Australian or the, uh, the Japanese or the Asians. Why? Oh, because that's the way it has pleased him to make us. Other people, especially women, they want their air to look stretched and coily like that of the American woman, like that of the Australian woman, like that of the British woman. That is not the purpose of God. You see, you cannot just take that temple and change things the way you want and then disfigure it and paint it and, and burn it up and coil it and do whatever you want. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which, which is in you? Ye are not, ye are of God, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. Ye are not your own. Ye are not your own. The Lord wants us to live it as it is. As it is. You see, there are times that people, uh, they say they are ashamed of uh, looking like this, of looking like that. And therefore, they go into a lot of expenses. Eventually, it leads you into worldliness. Well, why don't you just realize that you are totally dedicated unto the Lord. You belong unto the Lord. And it says there for him, verse 20, for ye are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God. Then in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I'm reading to you from verse 14 and verse 15. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then were all dead, and that he died for all that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves. You see that? Henceforth, they which live should not live unto themselves, but unto him that died for them and rose again, rose again. Well, I'm sure you know that all this is directed to believers, real, be real believers, real children of God. Children of God are the people that do not argue, are the people that do not have pride. They are the people that will not say, no, I'm the owner of myself. I will appear the way I want. I will dress the way I want. I will put on whatever I want to see. Rebellion does not belong to the household of faith. Rebellion does not belong to the people that really have God. You see, there are people that uh, say, we don't want any control from anybody. Everything we have is our own. Nobody is Lord over us. Well, if you are saying that, you are not the first person to say that. There have been people before you, motivated by Satan, energized by Satan, that rebelled like that. Let me show you an example of them. In Psalm 12, Psalm 12, reading from verse 1. Help, Lord, for the godly man ceases, for the faithful fall from among the children of men. They speak vanity, every one with his neighbor, with flattering lips. And with a double heart, do they speak? The Lord shall cut off all flattering leaves and the tongue that speaketh proud things. What proud things are they saying? Verse 4. Who have said, With our tongue we shall prevail. Our leaves are our own. Who is Lord over us? Do you see God hates that kind of language? My body belongs to me. Anywhere I want to put holes, I will put holes so that I will make myself attractive and smart before people. You see that language? God hates that kind of language. And uh, my neck belongs to me. My hand belongs to me. I want to put chain there. I want to put ring there. I will do what I want to do. Nobody can control me. God hates that kind of language. And if I want to expose my nakedness, it's nobody's business. I don't want anybody uh, correcting me. I'm going to do whatever I want. You see, God hates that language. It's just like saying, our tongue is ours. Our leaves are our own. Who is Lord over us? Well, you see that we were children of God. We were redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. We belong to the Lord. And because we belong to the Lord, He has redeemed us for, redeemed us for a purpose. Remember again, redemption brings responsibility. 
redemption brings responsibility. In Isaiah chapter 43, verse 7. Isaiah chapter 43, verse 7. Even everyone that is called by my name, no exception, no exception, even everyone that is called by my name, for I have created him for my glory, not your own glory, not your vain glory, not for your pride. I have created him for my glory. I have formed him, yea, I have made him. In verse 21, these people, the redeemed of the Lord, these people, those who are saved, these people, those who are called by the name of the Lord, these people have I formed for myself. You are not formed for yourself. You are not, you are not saved for yourself. These people have I formed for myself. They shall show forth my praise. They shall show forth my praise. You are not created to show forth your own glory, to show forth your own pride or your own beauty so that you can be a source of temptation to the women and to the men all around. You are saved so that you can become an instrument of salvation in the hand of the Lord to bring other people to know the Lord. And your pride will not bring people to know the Lord. Your worldliness will not bring people to know the Lord. All that jewelry and the cosmetics will not bring people to know the Lord. Dressing in a way that is contrary to the will of God and the revelation of the word of God will not bring people to know the Lord. You may think it will bring people to know the Lord, but that's not the way of the Lord. Rebellion will not bring people to know the Lord. It is when you realize that you are the temple of the Holy Ghost. And as the Lord wanted that temple to be, you want to remain like that. That is when the praise of God will shine forth and show forth through your life. Let us do things the way the Lord wants things to be done. A redeemed people become the property of the Redeemer. When God acts in grace towards his people, he thereby establishes claims upon them. And to all of us and for all of us who are born again, I've read it to you already, that God says, you are not your own, you are bought with a price. Total devotedness to God is the very first thing that God has a right to look for from the blood, blood, blood bought people. The people who have been redeemed by the power of the Lord. Now we go to the third point, which is guidance for God's redeemed people. Guidance for God's redeemed people. We're looking at Exodus chapter 13, verses 17 and 18. Exodus 13, verses 17 and 18. And it came to pass when Pharaoh had let the people go, that God led them not through the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. And for God said, lest peradventure the people repent when they see war, and they return to Egypt. But God led the people about through the way of the wilderness and of the Red Sea. And the children of Israel went up and asked out of the land of Egypt. Oh, there are so many things in those two verses I've read to you. I pray God will open our eyes to see. I pray that the Spirit of God will reveal the truth to us in Jesus' name. You see, the people that do not know the truth, the people that do not have the truth in their Christian lives, they cannot live a straightforward life. They cannot live a victorious life. They will not be able to live a life well pleasing unto the Lord. And I want to, I want to show you the word of God in these two verses. I wish we had time. But in the little time we have, let us look at it in the latter part of verse 18. It says, And the children of Israel went up and asked. That is, they went up in Amor out of the land of Egypt. What were they thinking? Oh, they were thinking as they were going out of the land of Egypt. It is possible another nation like Egypt may, may double-cross them on the way and may come across them and want to hold them into captivity. And they went up and nest out of the land of Egypt. But you see, even though they were like that, and they put on some kind of armor as they went out of the land of Egypt, what we are told is that God did not lead them through the way where they will see war. Do you see that man's, uh, man's desire or man's proposal many times is not God's intention. It's not what God was planning. As they were going out, they were already thinking about war. 
already thinking about if any nation will do, will come across us and want to wage any war against us we are going to fight for our right haven't begun in the spirit do you want to end up in the flesh the lord has saved you and the time of deliverance and the way of deliverance and the method of deliverance and the means of deliverance everything came from him now that everything has come from him do you want to take loss into your hand and feel that anything i come against i will deal with it you don't want to do that you want to depend totally upon the lord there's another lesson here you see it says that god led them not through the way of the land of the philistines although that was near the lord chose the way for the people to go through the wilderness they were not left alone to choose their own path i need to tell you something about that you see moses had been in that wilderness how many years 40 years he knew the corners he knew the valleys he knew the mountains he knew the rivers he knew all those places because he had many times taken the sheep of jethro in in all those places from between between that place uh, egypt and midian and yet you see moses did not say oh lord i know the way you have delivered us we will go our own way you see there are some preachers they don't do like moses they, they say well we know it already we are taught in seminary we are taught in sunday school we know everything we should do already we do not need the guidance of the spirit of god you see such people you cannot make it in the ministry we have to forget our wisdom we have to forget our knowledge we have to forget our past experiences and direct the people of god according to the way of the lord not only that you see in the case of moses he was just following the lord sheepishly he was following the lord as a person that didn't want to rely upon himself upon his past experience that is what we ought to do as children of god not depending upon yourself now pay attention you know there are some people that become leaders in the church before they became leaders in the church maybe they were the manager of the marketing board or they were the manager or the director of a particular company oh and they say leadership is leadership i used to direct i used to lead the marketing board i used to direct that corporation i used to that this is the way we do it in our secular employment then they come to the church and instead of allowing god to lead us in his own way uh, they say well we know the way they will say pastor that way you are taking us that you say the lord has told you to take us is a longer way we know a nearer way doesn't god know that nearer way the easier way what you call the better way doesn't god know god knows everything and yet god says he will not direct the people through the past experience of moses and god doesn't want to direct this church through the experience that somebody has gathered from the marketing board or from the corporation or from the whatever it is where you are coming from he wants to direct us in his own way that is why we have to tear all human agenda into pieces that is why we have to tear all the advice of men and women hey we can do it this way we can do it this way this is how they do it in celestial this is how they do it in methodist this is how they do it in anglican this is how they do it in apostolic faith this is how they do it in first square that's why we have to tear all those agenda into pieces and let god lead his own church let god direct his own people there's another lesson we learned here do you know that the children of israel they knew that this is going to be a far way that it was going to take them through and yet they did not they did not complain and you know aaron was older than moses and aaron was more eloquent than moses well although aaron had his weaknesses and you'll see that as we continue to study but this i appreciate in the life of aaron more eloquent than moses older than moses obviously it could be more intelligent even than moses but with all the qualities he had i never find him arguing with moses saying moses now you have to listen because your senior brother is talking to you even though now we are leading these people in the light in the wilderness leading them to the promised land but this is your senior brother and your senior brother is telling you that this way we are going is going to be longer and therefore let us use our common sense let us use our own mind let us use our own intelligence and let us go this way aaron never never did that not only that the elders of the children of israel did not come up with a committee the committee that will say now moses we are appealing to you we're writing a petition unto you you see our children are young our women are weak 
and also the, the, the herds and the cattle that we have. If we go through this long journey, how do you think about it, Moses? Are we just going to be following sheepishly? When there is a shorter way, when there is an easier way, why don't we take the easier way? You see, the, there was no committee like that. Nobody did that. What surprises me is that in many churches today, once those young people who have experienced from, as I said, their marketing board or whatever board it is, once they have that experience, they will write a note to the pastor. Pastor, we want an urgent meeting with you. And with this committee that we have, you know, formed ourselves without the guidance of God, we need to tell you something that this way is hard, this way is not good, and we're going to have it our own way. It was not like that in the days of the people of God. And as you come to the New Testament, it is not like that. It is not the people of God that will set up a committee to dictate the doctrine where to preach and the times where to preach those doctrines and the way where to do and how where to lead the people of God into the promised land. Let God be God and let men stay in their position. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. And that is why we thank God in this church that we teach the word of God. As we teach the word of God, then the people who want to get to heaven, the people who are looking for holiness, the people who want to be near unto God, they follow the Lord. It may not be the easiest way, the way of the cross leads home. It is good for us to know as we're journeying from this place unto the yonder land, to know that it is the way of the cross that leads home. That's why we sing that we're going to abandon. We're going to say bye-bye to the ways of the world. So that we can take the way of the Lord. Because it may seem longer. It may seem more difficult. It may seem as if it will bring persecution. It may even seem as if uh, we are not going to be able to make it. It may seem very narrow and very straight. But it is the way of the cross. That is the way of the Lord. And that is the way that actually leads home. You see, God never left anything to chance. He let them, he did not allow them to have their poor reasonings to be leading them. He led them by the way that he knew they, they should be able to make it. You see, the northern, those who have studied the map of that wilderness, and those who have seen the geography of uh, that place, they have told us that the direct northern route from Egypt to Palestine was about 200 miles. And they could have covered that distance within two weeks. And they would just be in the land of Canaan. Oh, you say, wouldn't that have been wonderful? I tell you, it would have been terrible. Why? Would it have been terrible? How would they know anything of the destruction of the Egyptians in the Red Sea? You see, God had a purpose. And this is why we glorify him because of his wisdom. He knew that Pharaoh, he had not finished with Pharaoh. He had not finished with those magicians. He had not finished with those Egyptians. He knew that the Egyptians and Pharaoh with the chariots were want to follow the children of Israel. And he wanted to demonstrate his power to the whole world to drown those the Egyptian army in the Red Sea. That is why he took them by that way. And then you can see as we study later, you'll see how they were drowned in the Red Sea. If they didn't take that way, if they didn't take that place they took, how would they have got that miracle of drowning those Egyptians in the Red Sea? You see, when you do not take the way of the Lord, we miss many miracles. When we take the way of the committee and the way of human knowledge, the way of human experience, the way of human expertise, and the way of human training, when that is the way we are taking, we're going to miss a lot of miracles. But when we take the longer way, the more difficult way, when we take the way of the cross, when we take the way the Lord is leading us by, then we will be able to see the miracles we ought to see. Not only that, the Lord tells, tells us in Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 2, He led them that way to humble them. To humble them. You see, the Lord needs to humble us. He needs to destroy and knock and crush the pride and the depravity in our heart. The way He leads us many times will show the, hum the humiliation we need, the humility we need, so that he will be able to get purge out of us the pride and the depravity. How would they have had the law? You see, God wanted them to be uh, to have the law before they got to the land of promise. He didn't want them to get to the land of promise as lawless people. If they were to go through the northern route from Egypt to Palestine within two weeks, God will not have, you see, Moses had to go how many days to the mountain to get that law? 40 days. 40 days already, that's more than uh, that's more than two weeks. If they had gone there, how would they have gone to the mountain of God to get the law from the hand of God? 
God knows what he's doing. When God leads us in a particular way, he knows what he's doing. And all we have to do is just to say, Lord, thy way is perfect. And you should lead us as it is good unto thee. And so I want you to notice all those lessons so that by the grace of God, we continue following the Lord. Now, they didn't follow the Lord grumbling. They didn't say, well, we know the way. We know a shorter way. And we know that this way we are taking is uh, longer. But you can't talk. Because they say it's God. They say that that is what God said. If you talk now, they will say that you are rebellion. You are rebelling. Therefore, we will not talk. We will just follow them. What can we do? Since they say it is God. If we try to challenge them and say that this is a shorter way, let us use our common sense. They say no common sense, no intelligence, no education, no marketing board expertise. Let us just go this longer way. Well, we will not talk. Let us be following them. They didn't follow like that. They didn't follow like that. What are you going to do like that? What are you going to say? Well, they have said so. Let us go. Don't do like that. Follow the Lord joyfully. And let us suffer together. And let us climb the mountain together. Let us go through that valley together. Let us go through that Red Sea together. And joyfully, cheerfully, happily, we will say, because this is the way of the Lord, it is the best way. We may not even understand, but we know this is the way God has permitted. After all, if God wants to change it without committee, he will change it. If God wants to get us through another way which you are thinking about, without any petition, without any argument, without any committee, without any fighting, without ever pulling anything apart, and without any contradiction, and without division in the church, God can change everything, and God can take us through that better way. Why don't we wait on God and just follow joyfully why he's leading us on? The Lord is wonderful, and the word of God is so full for us. Now, as we round up, we're going to look at verses 21 and 22. Verses 21 and 22. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of a cloud to lead them by the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light to go by day and night. He, he took not away the pillar of cloud by day, nor the pillar of fire by night, from before his people. Those two verses contain quite a lot. You see, God gave the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire to Israel so as to guide them across the wilderness. This pillar was the visible sign of the Lord's presence with the children of Israel. Today, it typifies for us the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Let's say, in our conclusion, let us look at seven points concerning that pillar and the comparison between that pillar and the Holy Spirit. Number one, the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire was given, was not given to Israel until they had been delivered from Egypt. Very, very important. If you don't have where you are going, God will not give you anything or anyone to lead you there. It was when they came out of the land of Egypt that God now gave them the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire so as to lead them to the promised land. And it's uh, like the Holy Spirit. You see, the Holy Spirit will not bear witness with your heart until you are born again. He will not be directing you. You want him to direct your marriage. You want him to direct your life. You want him to direct your career. You want him to direct your relationship. You want him to guide you every step of the way. You have to come out of Egypt first. You have to be born again first. It is after you are born again, he will now begin to lead you as the way you ought to be led by the Lord. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. So the prerequisite, the very first thing that ought to happen before the Holy Spirit can guide you is that you must be born again. Number two, the pillar of cloud was given to guide Israel through their wilderness journey. You see, we're also given the Holy Spirit to guide us in this wilderness of the world, in this confusing situation in the world. Number three, the pillar of fire gave them light. You see, in the night, that pillar will just become like the pillar of fire. In the night, it will give them heat, it will give them light, and then they'll be able to see in that wilderness, wild animals too will be able to see that uh, the, the symbol or the, the reality of that pillar of fire, and then those wild animals will be running away because those wild animals will be seeing a pillar of fire moving, a pillar of fire moving, and they had never seen anything like that in that wilderness before. It kept those beasts away. Do you know that is what the Holy Spirit does in our lives? Number one, it gives us light. 
as it gives us the light it shines abroad in our heart it shines very clearly in our life you see it will just open up like this something that has been darkened or confusing unto you the holy spirit will shed light on it by the scriptures and then you will see not only that the presence of the holy spirit is uh, what drives those demons away the fire of the holy spirit all within you is what will drive those uh, evil spirits and those demons and familiar spirits away they will not even be able to come near you remember it says he'll baptize them with the holy ghost and with fire number four the cloud was given to them for a covering you see in the wilderness it was so hot because of the scorching heat of the sun Therefore, in the afternoon, in the daytime, that cloud will be, that, that a pillar will just uh, be transformed to uh, a pillar of cloud. It will protect them like an umbrella upon them. We're told that the refreshing will come from the Holy Spirit. That when he gives us the Holy Spirit, he will shield us from the heat. And therefore, we will have the refreshing and the rest. Everything will be cool. Number five, God spoke from the crowd. He spake unto them in the cloudy pillar in Psalm 99, verse 7. And we know that the Holy Spirit speaks to the church. You remember that in Antioch they were praying and fasting, ministering unto the Lord. And the Holy Spirit spoke and said, Separate unto me Barnabas and Saul for the work that I have for them. Number 6. All through Israel's wilderness wanderings, this cloud was never taken away from them. And it is the same thing we learn. Jesus said, I will give you the Holy Ghost, the Comforter. And it will abide with you forever. Then we are told in Isaiah chapter 4 verses 4 and 5. And this is blessed to learn. That the cloud shall once more descend upon and dwell among Israel in the future. You see that cloud Israel cannot see it now. But we are told that in the future. That cloud, that fire will also appear to them once again. It, that will be the time when the spirit of God pours out upon Israel. The spirit of supplication and tears. And they will begin to look at the Messiah, whom they appears, and they would say, Where did you sustain this injury? Then they will tell them, and they will mourn for him as you mourn for an only child. So the Spirit of God is still going to walk in a mighty, wonderful way. After the church has been taken away, the Holy Spirit will concentrate very much on the children of Israel so as to be able to bring them to the kingdom and prepare them for the second coming of the Lord. What a truly marvelous type of the person and ministry of the Holy Spirit was a fairy and a cloudy pillar. The Lord has taught us a lot today that we need to take to the Lord in prayer. He has taught us that our gathering should always be orderly, not be confusion or commotion in our meetings. He has also taught us that there's discipleship following after decision, instruction following after salvation. That after we have come out of Egypt, we need a lot of instruction to guide us in our journey to go to the promised land. And he has told us that we should remember because it is the remembrance of these gracious acts that will make us to be grateful, to be thankful, and to be obedient, to be faithful, and also to have more faith for greater things. And you have seen that we always have valuable repetition so that there will be no leaven within our lives, no sin within our lives. And you have also seen that all the firstborn are to be conse consecrated, set apart, devoted unto the Lord. That redemption brings uh, responsibility. We have also seen that the Lord is guiding us, is leading us. And though the way he leads us may appear long, it may not be the shortest and the easiest way. But the way of the cross leads home. We will not argue, we will not rebel, we will not set up any kind of committee that will write petition and rebel against the way of the Lord. The Lord has been leading since we started. Why are we going to go the way of the flesh now? Why don't we continue to follow the Spirit of God and follow the Scripture? The Lord has brought us to this place so that He can lead us on. Let us unite together. Let us pray unto the Lord that the Lord will continue to lead and guide us by His Word. And we pray that as He leads us like that, none of us will miss that glorious, wonderful day. When a trumpet shall sound and the saints shall be taken away and we shall all go in the rapture, it will be a wonderful moment to be with the Lord. Let us endure whatever difficulty, whatever opposition and whatever dangers are in the way now. Let us overcome by the power of the Lord in our lives and let us follow on, not rebelling but always following on, being submissive, obeying them that watch over you. For the watch for your souls are they that will give account. Let us devote ourselves to the Lord. Commit ourselves to the Lord. 
that as it leads us will continue to follow pray unto the lord and pray through pray in all that we have learned before you go today